As you can see, Pastor is still having hip problems. Yes, sir. 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 Uh, as we discuss the whole thing that has to do with marriage and relationship, listen. If you're married, it's good to, 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 you definitely should take this into consideration. Yeah, but if you're not married, if you just got a, you know, your somebody that's your significant other, you still should take notice of what you say because these these things that this that the Bible encourages us to do is going to make sure that you have a wonderful relationship, no matter what. Amen? Amen. So, before we get started with this sermon, good to see you. Let's open with prayer. Yes, sir. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you thanking you once again, Lord, for all that you're doing as you teach us how to relationally, Lord, how to have the proper relationship with our significant other, our our uh, marriage partners, and um, and if we, even if we are dating somebody, uh, it's important for us to have the right kind of relationship. Jesus moves us towards that kind of relationship yes, so that we know what it should all be about, and also, Lord, what it should not be. And so, Lord, help us to learn, teach us, draw us to, uh, to that burning fire, that love that we have in our hearts Lord, for one another. Help us, Lord, to do the right thing. So, Lord, we thank you for all that you do. Teach us what's going to be talked about today. Help us, help us, Lord, to take it all and, and hold on to it because um, it's very, very important. Uh, as we move forward in our relationship with you. So thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We pray for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. True love and marriage. What it should and should not be. My focus statement of the day is that the Bible shows us what true love and marriage should look like. So now, why don't we get it? What's happening? I mean, why do we? Why don't we get it? My function statement of the day is that we are going to truly look at the way Jesus loves His church, so that we can know how to love our wives. Amen. Amen. It's important. We need to know how to love our wives. It's important for us to do this. Now I'm speaking to you today about this topic because of a true milestone that will be hap that's um, happened in my life just lately. I went my life from one time to another and I didn't stay with nobody. My life was just mixed up. If uh, if you burnt my bacon, you had to go. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> if you burnt my taco, No, quite honestly, I didn't. I didn't have a, the, the, the true feeling that I should have for my wife as a, as life went on. Now I'm speaking to you today about this topic because that that milestone of mine was that I stayed with my wife and I actually had a 27 year of being with my wife. 27 years. That's a long time, amen? 27 years. So that's important. I mean, I can't even believe it. That is really something for me because as, a, as I reflect on my past, I never stayed with anybody that long. I used to believe that a man's strength was measured by his sexual appetite. That's the way I used to believe, yeah. 
That's the truth. You see, my father raised me to believe that men should have as many women as he can have. That's how we my dad grew me up. And he, he, he was with my mom. He just broke her mind. Every time I turned around, so I'd watch him to see what he was doing. And I would move my life, change my life, and do the things that he was doing. He didn't believe that a man should be faithful to anybody but himself. So that's how he raised me. Now when I got with my wife, my wife told me, she said, you want this marriage to last? Don't you ever put your hands on me? And love her. Love her new dad. And so that's what I chose to do. I chose to do it. And I chose to do it. Hello? Yeah, hello. Okay. I chose to do it because I didn't want to break my wife's heart the way I saw my mother's heart get broken. And so I look out here and I see all these wonderful men and these wonderful, wonderful women. And I'm going to tell you, men, don't break these girls' hearts. If you've got somebody that you want to give your heart to, she needs to be number one. Amen? So, one thing about it, as I grew up and got older, I watched the way that his life affected my mother. And I watched him break her heart over and over again. Now, when my mother died, she was just a shadow. She was just a shadow. Half, half the woman she used to be. She was so broken inside. And although she loved my father with all her heart, there was absolutely no trust in their relationship. And I kept looking at this and I kept saying to myself, I don't want to be my wife. I want my wife to be me and always have trust in our relationship. Amen? And I want that for you too. I want that for you also. Well, as I continue to grow into manhood, many things happened to me that led me down a path where I continued to be promiscuous. I had a promiscuous lifestyle. You see, I felt that as long as I wasn't married, I didn't have to be faithful to anybody. If I was free, I didn't have to do nothing except let no woman know that I needed to be faithful. But you know what, guys? If you're going to get a girl and you're going to love her and give her your heart, you need to be faithful. Amen? Amen. You need to be faithful. I mean, I was single and free back in those days, and I felt that I didn't have to answer anybody. But I didn't count on the fact that Jesus was going to get a hold of me. He was going to take me and he was going to do and manipulate my heart into the way it was supposed to be so that I would belong to him. You see, before I met Jesus, I had no respect for the marriage arrangement. No. No respect for it. I changed women just like I was. Changing socks. You all know what I mean. That was mainly because of what I saw happening between my own mother and father. You guys, if you if you uh, look at the past and see what your mother and father was like, you probably maybe even felt the same way I did. That was mainly because of what I saw between those two. And so I began to marry when I was 21 years old. 21. I married my first wife, thinking that I was in love. But it quickly came to the realization that I didn't even know what love was. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I didn't know what love was. I didn't want to be held down. And when I had just come to the age, come to the age where I 
go out and party in the bar scene when I got to that age. I don't want to be held down. I was going to go out there and boogaloo. <laughs> do what I want to do. Back in the 70s, I learned how to go out, meet single women in the bars, and engage in, a, in extracurricular activities. That's what I used to love to do. In the 70s, it wasn't as dangerous as it is today. Amen. It's dangerous. Now, you can't go out with guys, you can't go out. I'm not saying just guys. None of us can go out and mess around. You can catch something that you can't get rid of. You know, like old luggage. You know what I'm saying? The mess the other. So you got to watch out. The sexual revolution in the 70s, at worst, caused you to maybe get an STD that could be treated by a shot of penicillin. No, 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 no. But nowadays, you can get something that will never leave you. That's right. And can be absolutely fatal. Now, while I was married to my first wife, I met a woman that I that uh, that was so beautiful. I couldn't help but follow the lust that was in my heart. Sure was good. And when I had finally divorced my first wife. I ended up marrying the second wife. Now that marriage didn't last either. Because when you marry for looks or for sex, there is no root that is deep enough or strong enough to hold you or to hold your relationship together. Do you understand what I'm saying? Beauty just don't get it. That's all it is. That's right. And plus, not only that, your heart ain't right. And it's not, it's not whatever, whatever it is that you feel it, it isn't going to be strong enough to hold you together. And that's what happened to me. All I did was just hold me closer. That's what it used to do. But you know what? It just doesn't last. And so the next thing you know, my second divorce was in the, was in the main. There is no root that is deep enough or strong enough to hold the relationship together. Because if the first marriage wasn't strong enough, if it wasn't strong enough to hold you together because of lust, what makes us think, what makes us think that the next one uh, will be able to hold or withstand the same thing. Listen, if you if you got a lustful spirit, and I'm gonna tell you right now, that can happen to us. And there's nothing you can do about it until you give it to Jesus. You understand? You gotta ask the Lord to help you with it. Because if you can't hold it together, you need him to help you. That's what's coming for me. I'll tell you right now, I wasn't strong enough to hold together, but was. Jesus was. And he's the one that's made my life and my wife okay. So now, when I got rid of that, at the age of about no, 26, I had been married twice. And so I decided to not get married again. But as fate would happen, I met a woman that worked for Western Airlines uh, in Hawaii, where I used to live. And so, when we got together, she wanted to get married, and so I started thinking, well, if I marry her, I can travel all over the world. <laughs> I know that ain't right. <laughs> I know I was not right. I can travel all over the world and I can do it for free. So when I got married to her, I went all over the place. I went all over the place. Fiji, you know, South America. I was just doing it, just having a good old time. So we got married on the beach in Kona, Hawaii. And, you know, <laughs> I'm going to tell you the story. 
I had an afro. I had an afro that was this big, stood out here like this. So we ended up over at Tacoma, a hotel, partying with my uh, for getting married. I was laughing so hard, I bent over, stuck my hair in a candle, and my fro went up like that. Uh, next time I had all these people beat me on the head. <laughs> I come up with a red good bite. But uh, yeah, that was a mess, Gary. You know what I'm saying? But uh, anyway, that's, that's the way that happened. So that, you know, that whole thing that went on there um, started my traveling, traveling things going on. I was all over the place. What did you want? I'm Saipan, Palau, all these different islands. Now after that, I decided to stay single and did that for the next 10 years. 10 years. Now during this 10 year period was when, when I went through uh, my devastating homelessness years. Devastating. Devastating. That finally resulted in my Anyway, I didn't care what it cost. 
I would never let it go without a gun. As time went on, I can easily say that Lucy was and is the best person I've ever known. And that's why I am as protective over my wife the way that I am. I, I am very protective over her. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians 5. We're going to read 22 to 33. I'm going to bring my brother Gary up here. He's going to read it for us. If you're able to stand. What I said. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also, husbands ought to also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This, is, this mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Let's be seated. <laughs> the Lord really, really spells it out for us, doesn't he? He lets us know how it is and how the relationship is supposed to go. This individual one also is to love his own love. You know, when I, when I, when I do that, it only makes sense that if I love my wife, then I'm going to love myself. Because since she is part of me, then I want to make sure that she's okay with all of it. Amen? So, we can see here that there is a way that we are to love our wives. So let's take a look at these ways. And keep in mind, this is where the Jesus loves us. Wives should be in subjection to their own husbands. Now, I've been married a few times, so I know what it's like to have a wife that's not in subjection. She just wants to do his own thing and arguing with you and the whole bit. We need to understand that we need to. Can we get a word now? Yeah. We don't argue. Explain. Explain. We don't complain, we explain. <laughs> I want you to take a look at what that means. See? I'm not arguing. What we need to do is be in subjection. We need to be in subjection. Alright, alright. Okay, that's what the word says. Wives should be in subjection to their own husbands yes, as to the Lord. Yes, sir. 
Now why is that? Well, think about it. Verse 23. Verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife. He's the head. Now my wife likes to say, Yeah, you're the head, but I'm the neck. And I will turn you in a yeah, we got we got all this stuff going on, but you know something? The Lord He makes it plain and simple. We are the head, really. In other words, what we are responsible for is what Jesus says we're responsible for. Amen. Amen. And that's the name of that. Okay, why well, should we answer question of our own husband as to the Lord? Why is that? Because he is there. And it's God given. Number two it says, husbands, love your wives. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just as Christ also loved yes, the church and gave right himself up for her. Listen, we are supposed to love our wives with a sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. In other words, if something's going on and you need to make a decision, you need to make it with her in front of you and make it for her because the good is going to come to her. Don't be thinking about things just for yourself because that's how we can easily make decisions thinking that we got it going on and it's all about us. We need to, we need to keep our wives in mind. And Making sure that whatever decision that you make is going to be good. It's going to be good for her, not just for you. Make sense? Amen? Amen. <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> okay. Hey, you love it, just love your wives just as Christ loved the church yeah, and gave himself up for her. Now when it says that Christ gave himself up for her, what does that mean? He actually died for his day. Christ died for his church. If we love our wives, we should be ready to die for them. And that's why it's so important. Make sure you keep your eye on if you're going to marry somebody. Keep your eyes open. Don't make no mistakes. You know, we can make a mistake really. Also, what is, what is it that we should be? Not controlling. We should not be controlling. No, sir. No, sir. We also should not be jealous. Or no, not, no. not too jealous. Okay, now to them. Now what does that mean? That means if you're walking around and every time I look at my wife, she keeps she talking to someone, so on. she got her eye on such and such. I'm telling her, girl, you better get back. <laughs> no, we just don't need to be jealous. Love your wife. And if you're not jealous, if you're not the jealous kind, you're going to be free. She's going to be free to live her life. Also, Respect your wife's intelligence. That's real important. I'll tell you something. I, I married Lucy, and I knew that Lucy had a good head on her shoulders just because of the job she had. She worked for Bank of America for, for 26 years. So, so if nothing else, a girl can count. You know, you can count. If I can give her some money, she can count it. And she can hold on to it. And if that money's gone, she's fired. Not really. Not really. I know, huh? Lucy, Lucy watches over me. My wife watches over me. That's one of the reasons why when she came into this church, she is involved in the finance. And keeping, keeping everything on board. You got to keep that in mind. Also, understand that there is more than one way to skin a cat. What does that mean? That means that when there's a problem, when something needs to be taken care of, 
This is what your wife says. It's important. Because there's, you know, I might have a way to take care of my mom, but so does she. And if she's got a way, I need to listen to what she's saying. Amen? Also, do not let anyone harm your wife, physically or emotionally or inside. That's why I'm very protective of her. I've actually gotten into bouts outside the church here, somebody talking back to my wife. Everybody's looking at me like, look, you're the pastor. Yeah, I'm a pastor that will whoop your wife. <laughs> That's the word of my wife. And, and that's, the way, that's the way it should be. You love your wife? Don't let nobody mess with it. That's like messing with you. So we got to keep that on. You know? Jesus gave himself up for her. We should be ready to protect our wives just like Jesus protected his church from the ultimate harm. If you got to give your life to your wife, you should be ready to do that. So, so we need to always be ready because he sanctifies us by his word. Now also, we are to love our wives as our own bodies. Now listen to what they're saying. Love your wife as your own body. Now your own body, you make sure you feed it, don't you? You feed it, you wash it, you, you take care of it, you, 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 know, you try to heal whatever is wrong with it, you need to try to get it in a healing status. We need to think of our wives that way really also. Love our wives as our own body. For he who loves his wife, what does the word say? Love his wife, you love yourself. Amen. Amen. So nobody hates himself, but cherishes it and nourishes it. That's the way that we're supposed to live our lives. Amen? Yeah. Also, just like Jesus nourishes the church by his word, food for the spirit. Now, when we get married, we are no longer two individuals, but one. Genesis 2, 24 says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. Do you understand? Joined to your wife. I mean, you all want to get up and move or whatever you got, you know, that's what you do. Why is that? So you got your own house.
to the image of his son. So that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now a lot of people don't realize what this is talking about. You, 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 you. Christ was the firstborn of many brethren. What does that mean? It means his body was changed. And he was the first one of us. And what we're going to be. When the time comes, we're going to come together with what he's done. And it's going to be marvelous. So, says so that he would be the first one among many brethren. There's going to be many of us that are going to be like him. We're going to become a light brother. And I can't wait. I can't wait. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying. I'm about to stand away. So, what was Jesus like after he was raised from the dead? Well, scripture tells us that he was able to do many miraculous things. It says that he was able to appear and disappear. Walk through walls where he, he would appear inside closed rooms. Jesus was able to do all kinds of fantastic things. Luke 24, 51 tells us how Jesus was lifted up while blessing his disciples where he literally flew away. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be ready to go. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? Yes, you want sir. To go out We're ready now. You know what I mean? You want to go with me? We're going to go. So how is Jesus able to do all these things? I believe that he was able to do these things because upon his resurrection, he received a body that was no longer like the one he possessed at his crucifixion. It was no longer like that. He received a body that was no longer able to die. He received a body that Paul describes as being much more than the one he had at his crucifixion because he says in Philippians 3 21 that our bodies will be transformed, transformed from this humble state, from this humble state into conformity with his body of glory. So what is this body of glory? This is what we know, this is what is known as a glorified body. Remember this, a glorified body. So a body that is able to do anything that our flesh can do, but is also able to do everything that the spirit is able to do. Isn't that, massive, isn't that fantastic? Whatever it is that our bodies can do physically now, it'll be able to do that, but it'll also be able to do whatever the Spirit can do. Now I'm going to tell you something, but this is my, 
Ladies and gentlemen, this should keep you always, always want to stay in line with what Jesus is doing. Be obedient to what he says. Don't do anything that's going to mess you up. Just stay in line. Christ has given you all the stuff that you need to know to be like him. Follow him. Yes, Lord. Because the time is going to come. It's going to come, come. You and me are going to walk in here. We're going to walk Come on, Lord. And do what we do. Amen? Amen. That's what we're going to do. So, remember, church. Marriage is not something to be taken lightly. No, it's not. It is an institution. Yes, it is. An arrangement that was invented by God. That's why something that was invented by God. Why is it that we got all the... The gay, the gay community want to get married. They marry each other, man. I look at all this stuff and I'm just you know, saying, right? Because this is something that was established by God. We don't have the right to change it. But anyway, it was invented by God Himself and should never be mocked or considered just a way to biblically have sex. Because trust me, after the fireworks go out, you are going to need something much stronger to hold on to. You're going to need to know how to love your mate. And you're going to need to know what your mate is supposed to be. Amen? Yeah. You got to know. You need yes. You need, it says you're going to need uh, something much stronger. You're going to need to know how to love your mate. Now, that doesn't mean that you can just pick and choose any old kind of mate that you want. Your mate, and to me, in order to make it what God has intended for it to be, your mate should be a man's mate, should be a woman. And a woman's mate should be a man. Now we're coming up with all this other stuff about you know what you think, what you think you should be able to do because you're free to do whatever you want. And you, you might be free to do whatever you want, but you yeah you're free to sin. But you got to remember there's a price to be paid. There's a price to be paid. Yes, sir. I don't know about you. I don't want to have to pay that price. Amen? Your marriage is going to need to be rooted in Jesus Christ. Because he is the one that is going to hold things together through his strength and blessing. He's going to hold it together. He's the one. So, what should be our marriage goal? or marital goals. Let me put it this way. From the wise words of Engelbert Humperdinck, <laughs> who said, after the loving, I'm still in love with you. So if you get married for sex, or any of that stuff, don't do that. You need to listen. After you love it, you need to be able to sit up and have a conversation. Amen? Does that make sense to you? 